So for today's lecture is we're going to start a new chapter, which is chapter three. Chapter three is a very short chapter in the textbook. It is just introduction about the capacitance and inductance. So uh, it means that we are going to cover the, this chapter over just two lectures. It is not a long chapter like chapter two. We spent some time covering chapter two because this is the most important chapter because we discussed the different methods of the analysis of electrical circuits in, in general. And, but we focused over the resistive uh, circuits. So let me explain to you a very quick something here about these electrical systems. So as we discussed before, any electrical circuit, let us talk very general. Any electrical circuit, it should include some, some controllers. And I'm gonna let you know what, what, what is the function of this controller. And you should have like a source, source of energy, which is like battery, and you should have output at the end. You could consider that this is the most general shape or form of any electrical circuit, whatever it is. Generally, we are doing electrical circuit for this reason, to operate something, to give an output power to an, to, uh, to an output electrical element. This electrical element would be a lamp, would be a fan, would be an electrical motor. So you're going to set up, for example, an electrical circuit to operate an electrical motor. So, but this electrical circuit, it should include some elements. This element will definitely include some conductors. These conductors are the wires. These are the wires. In addition, you should have source like battery, for example, like the battery. And you should have output, as we discussed, like this would be like, uh, like electrical motor, and there should be current. And we said that this current uh, are the representation of the speed of the flow of the electrons inside or through these different elements of the electrical circuit. In addition, we should have controllers. And this is the most important element, controllers, that we're going to discuss uh, here. So these controllers would have different forms as electrical element that would be used as controller. The one that we discussed so far are the resistors. We discussed before, and this is what we covered through chapter two. We discussed the resistor with the resistance R. This resistor is one type of the controller. What does it mean or what is, what is the function of the controller? The controller basically are used to give control on the amount of the current and the voltage through the electrical circuit or over any electrical element. For example, let us consider the simplest form ever for any electrical battery or electrical circuit. Like assume that you have a very a battery like this one, very simple battery, and you just have two wires here that already connected to a lamp. So what, how this, this is an electrical circuit, but this electrical circuit is just contain, con, uh, consists of conductors, which are the electrical wires in addition to the battery, in addition to the output. There is no controllers here for this battery or this electrical circuit, right? Like this is the positive and this is the negative charge and you're gonna have some electrons already rooming here. There is some current and you're gonna find at the end, this lamp is already switch it on once you just connect the two wires over the battery. This is the simplest electrical circuit ever yet you, you would experience, right? But this one has no controllers. So what does it mean? It means that the amount of energy, it will be delivered as it is to the lamp. How about if this energy, it is very small, the lamp won't gonna turn on. If the amount of energy that is that this battery gives or the amount of the power, electrical power, it is huge, over the capacity of this or the ability of this output, this output will be malfunction. This, the, this, the, the wire, the electrical wire that inside the lamp itself will be cut. So what does it mean? It means that the capacity or the energy delivered by the source, it is too huge in comparison to the output. So how we can control, and this is basically what we are using for many of the electrical circuit, like the electrical circuit that is used in your car, as we explained in the first lecture of this class. Like we would have a source, this source gives very um, huge amount of power and energy, and this amount should be distributed over different electrical outputs. We have to distribute over them. And each one of these outputs should take part of this total energy depending on its ability, depending on its capacity. 
So how we can do so? We need something to control the distribution. We need somebody, some guy who is going to distribute these voltage and energies over the different or the multiple elements. This guy who is going to distribute and control the flow of the electron and the power inside the electrical element and how we can distribute this power over the different elements within the electrical circuit is a controller. This is the function of the controllers in general. This is how we're going to understand the electrical circuit when you study a course in the senior year, in the last year of your bachelor degree, you're gonna take a course which is known as the dynamics and uh, controllers of mechanical system or, 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 or engineering systems in general. In this course, you're gonna study electrical uh, circuit again, electrical system like electrical circuit, and all the components, the element like resistors, you're gonna deal with it like controllers, okay? So what I'd like to demonstrate here that this is the general form of an electrical circuit, that it will have a source, some controllers, and there should be output. This controller would be resistor as we discussed in chapter two. This controller would be capacit will be capacitor or inductor, and this is what we are going to discuss here and through this, this chapter, is to discuss the inductor and the capacitor. And what are the things, go ahead. Yeah, it is an element definitely. There should be a switch here just to turn off or on the uh, electrical circuit. But I'm talking about the main, the main element of any electrical circuit that would be used for controlling, flowing the current and so on. So we do have the source, we do have controllers in addition to outputs. This controller would be resistors, capacitors or inductors. Or other, there are more advanced controllers. There are other more advanced types of controller also that we're gonna go over them through this class as we move, okay? But for now, we have discussed one type of the controller, which is the resistor. We are going through chapter three to discuss other two types of controllers, which are the inductors and capacitors. And know the, uh, what the inductor or the capacitor is going to do for the volt and the current. Make sense? So for example, I'm just gonna explain something here very quick. For example, let us consider, just refresh your mind about Ohm's law. What was the expression for Ohm's law? We said that Ohm's law it is V equals I times R, right? What is V? This should be the voltage over a resistor. This is voltage over resistor. And this R, it should be the resistance of the resistor, and this I, it should be the current. And this is commonly known as Ohm's law, as we discussed. So, what does it mean, this law? We can say that in case that you do have a resistor with a resistance R, this resistor will control the current flowing through it according to this equation, that it relates the current to the volt According to this relation, we're going to say that the volt it is proportionally related to the current through the resistor. And the constant of the pro proportional relation is the R itself. So that's why we said that V equals constant times I. This constant, it will be the resistance itself. This is according to Ohm's law. So here, this relation or the resistor gives us a certain way of controlling the relation between the volt and the current. Like all the time, the resistor gives us a proportional relation between the voltage and the current. So for example, if you decided to increase the volt, the current will be definitely increasing over the resistor. If you decided to decrease the volt, the current will be decreasing as well over the resistor. Make sense? You got it? So this is one way of controlling. As you increase one, the second is going to increase with a constant rate, with a linear relation. So for example, if I decided to draw the relation between the currents and the voltage over a resistor, this relation will be linear. As you increase one, the second is going to increase following the line or the straight line as given here. But how about if some reason, for some reason, we may need a relation, another relation between the volt and the current over another electrical element. It, it shouldn't be definitely resistor. 
How about, uh, can we make another electrical element that is different than the resistor that would give us this relation between the volt and the current? That would give us this relation between the volt and the current? Yes. This is the function of the other elements. You got my point? So the other element like capacitors or inductors gives different relation of the current in terms of volt or the volt in terms of the current. The proportional relation can be achieved only using the resistor. But the capacitors or the inductor, they provide different relation. And this is the objective of this chapter is to understand the relation between the volt and the current over the capacitor or the inductor. I'm pretty sure that these things that you had some experience about them from the physics class, but here we're going to consider them with more detail. And it is not just going to consider them. We just going to, in addition, we're going to use them for doing analysis for electrical circuits that would include resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Here we're gonna talk in general. Make sense? So through chapter two, just to understand the thing that we covered through this course, through chapter two, we just considered electrical circuit that just include resistors. Now, through chapter three, we're gonna consider, we're just gonna discuss what does it mean capacitance, what does, what does it mean inductance, what, what, the, what, what, what is the function of the inductor or the capacitor? Just understand these physical things. So that's why chapter three it is a short chapter. It's just very quick. We're going to finish this one during in two lectures. And today's lecture, we're going to discuss the capacitor. And the next meeting, we're going to discuss the inductance. Make sense? Then the week after, we're going to start talking about the chapter. We're going to move to chapter four. And in chapter four, we're going to know how we can do analysis to electrical circuit that include everything, that include resistors, capacitors, in addition to inductors in one electrical circuit. And we're going to use the same four methods that we covered in chapter four. We're going to use them again, but through chapter, uh, the, uh, the four methods that we discussed in chapter two, we're going to use them again in chapter four. Make sense? So, if we're going to talk about capacitance, what does it mean? Capacitance is the amount of energy that is stored in electric field. Electric field, you could consider this is like, like, electric field, like this is like an electric energy or electric force that is stored within an electrical element or within a certain material. Like, we have an electric field that is already stored somehow, some way, we're gonna store this electric field, then we're gonna use it for another time. Like we're gonna spend time to store, then in another time we're gonna make use of this energy that we just stored before, we're gonna use it for another, for, to do something. So capacitance, it means that there is an electric property that accounts for the energy stored in electric field. But inductance is the energy stored that accounts for the energy stored. There is electric property that accounts for the energy stored in magnetic field. So the difference between capacitance and detectance, capacitance depends on electric fields, stored energy within electric field. But inductance it is a stored energy within magnetic or due to magnetic field. So the inductance depends on the magnetic field. And if you remember from the physics class, there is a strict relation between the magnetic fields of our coils and the current through the coils themselves. It means that from using electrical coils and some electric field, we can generate magnetic field or the opposite. Using the magnetic field, we can end up with, with some electric field. So, and this is the function of the inductance and this is what we're gonna discuss the next meeting. But today we're just gonna focus on the capacitance and the capacitors. We discussed before in chapter two that the voltage across a resistor is proportional to the current. We said that V equals I times R. It, it is proportional relation. But the inductor, and this is what we're gonna discuss the next meeting, is proportional to the time derivative of the current. So what does it mean? It means that in the, in the conductor, the volt is, the, is proportional to the time derivative of the current, or the time derivative of the current, is proportional to the time derivative of the current. But the capacitor, it is proportional, the voltage is proportional to the integration of the current over time. So as you can see, we have different relation. The resistor gives direct relation between the current, it is proportional, the voltage is proportional to the current, but here it is proportional to the derivative of the current, therefore the capacitor is proportional to the integration of the current. 
So these different elements gives different relation between the volt and the current. It means that we can use them to control, to give better control of the volt and the current through the electrical elements or the electrical circuit. Make sense so far? So now let us move to the theory or the concept of the capacitor, how it works. Again, today's lecture, we're just gonna focus on the capacitance. This is like a very quick introduction to the chapter. Then we're gonna move to the capacitance. The inductors will be covered in the next meeting. The capacitors are constructed mainly of two sheets or two plates. This is one plate and there should be another plate down here. And these two blades are made of conducting material, like metallic. We, we, we said that, and this is what we discussed even in the start of this course, that metals are very good conductor material for electricity. So it means that these two blades are mainly made of metals. These are two blades made of metals. And there is a, a material that is squeezed between them or confined between these two blades. This material is known as dielectric material. The dielectric material is a material that is electric insulator that does not allow for kind of electri electrical conductivity, conductivity through its mat uh, this, this material. It means that this material, like insulator material, is commonly known as dielectric material. So this is what again? It would be air or it would be any other dielectric material. Okay, so the, uh, th this dielectric material is any material that basically will not allow for the electron to easily flow from one plate to the other plate. Okay, but this dielectric material itself includes some electrons and positive and negative charges, or in other words, includes some, uh, some positive and negative charges inside the dielectric material itself. It means that in the forget about there is no current, there is no flow, there is nothing. So there should be some positive charges and negative charges that randomly distribute inside this dielectric material. Lots of positive and negative charges already located inside this material. So what happened? We do have two conducting plates in this way. So when we allow the current to flow, the current that the current direction all the time it is opposite to the exact flow direction of the electrons. Forget about this detail for now, but assume that we do have this is the flow of the electrons. Like, and if you remember that we said that the electron, the each electron carries a negative charge. So it means that we do have a flow of electrons. All of them carry negative charges. These electrons will accumulate over this plate and they weren't gonna able to pass through the dielectric material because there is some insulating material here. It is not allowed for the electron to flow through this one, make sense? So what's gonna happen that all of these electrons, they're gonna accumulate over, collected together over this plate, giving a negative charge to this plate. So it becomes more negative as there are more electrons flowing into this plate. What happens to the negative charge here? We do have negative and positive charges. The positive charge definitely will be attracted to the negative charge down here. But the negative charge will be attractive to the other side because it's gonna take a positive charge. Make sense? So you're gonna have like some distribution, but if there is no current, these positive and negative charges inside the dielectric material itself became random then these charges will be distributed between the two plates depending on the charges. This, this blade, because it is negative, is gonna attract the positive charge. This blade, because it is positive, is gonna attract the negative charge. And as we deliver more electrons, because of the dielectric material, this electron, this, this produces more electric field that is stored, more stored energy, more stored energy inside the capacitor. Then after a while, we can allow for this electron to flow to make use of this electric charges that we already charged the capacitor with. It means that the capacitor is gonna work like a store. It's gonna take the charges, it's gonna take the electric energy, store this electric energy inside the capacitor for a while, then after that, we're gonna use this electric energy for, uh, for operating something within the electrical circuit. Make sense? But the good thing, somebody gonna say, okay, why am I storing the 
the the energy within the capacitor for a while, then I'm gonna use it. Why I didn't use the, the energy at once, directly, without the capacitor? So the key idea here is to use this one as a controller to, is, to increase the speed of the electron, the electron flow within the electrical circuit. It do something, it do change to the volt or the current within the electrical circuit. If you decided to use directly the flow of the electrons to operate the output or the motor, for example, as I'm gonna show you a video right now, okay? If you use directly without capacitor, the flow or the power that, it, that you already give to the electrical motor will be distributed over time. So the, the, energy, the energy will be distributed over a long time. So as, as you know that the power, it is energy divided by time. So the time has been increased. It means that you are giving less power, so the same energy, you are delivering the same energy, but over a long period of time. It means that the power it is lower. But if you give the same energy, but over a short period of time, so the power will be high. And this is the function of the capacitor. The capacitor keep collecting the energy that comes from the battery at slow rate then takes this energy at once and send them at a short period to give a high power. And that's why this is the benefit, one of the things that would be used for the capacitor. Make sense? So I'm gonna show you this video as illustration of the operating principle of the capacitor, how they work. So, as you can see, in the beginning we remove the capacitor, right? When we remove the capacitor, the, power, the energy, the same energy, because this battery has a certain amount of energy that it can send over a certain period of time. But this battery is too slow in sending the energy. So what happened basically, when we send the amount of energy that is needed for this motor to rotate, to lift the load, in the, brevet, in the video here, the load was lift, was lifted very slow. Do you see the load? It's going up too slow, right? Why? Because the power, it should be energy divided by time. So we are sending energy over a long period of time, so the power is too slow or too low power, okay? So, but how about if we would like to make use of the same energy, but over a shorter period of time, this is gonna give more power because as you know, the power is energy divided by time. Make sense? And this is the function of the capacitor.
charge. Let's put on that storage of GTEs. Okay. So now the capacitor, some kind of take all the energy of the battery. Because the energy, the battery, it is not efficient in sending the energy in a short time. So we're collecting all of this energy within the capacity. Now the capacity contains all the energy of this battery and store this energy. Now we're gonna use this energy of the capacitor to operate the motor. So it means that we are using the capacitor itself to operate the motor, not physically, we are, not, we are not using the battery itself. So are taking the energy, this is the simplest model. Take the energy of the battery, save this energy, store this energy inside the capacitor. Then now we're gonna use the capacitor as like the battery to operate the motor, okay? Make sense? So this is for the concept of the electrical uh, capacitors, how they are working. So we already discussed this concept. Now, how about the charge in terms of the voltage within the capacitor? So the charge equal the C. C stands for the capacitance of the capacitor. This is like we, as we mentioned, the resistor, it has resistance. The capacitor, it has capacitance. Time V, which stands for the volt over the capacitor itself. And if you remember that the definition of the volt, it is the volt itself it is energy. Like you give volt, like it, 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 like it is you give energy per unit time for the capacitor itself. Make sense? So it means that, as we mentioned, the capacitor is going to take time till charging. It means that we, if we connected the capacitor to the battery directly, so the battery is going to keep charging the capacitor. So the capacitor will be charged with an amount of a charge Q. This Q equals the capacitance of the capacitor time V. Make sense? Where V, this is the volt, C is the capacitor and it is measured in ferret. Ferret, this is the unit, which is, we basically write like uppercase F. Ferret, this is the unit of the capacitor, which is equivalent to the columns divided by V. V stands for the volt, C stands for columns. So this C, this C indicates, this C indicates column, but this one indicates capacitance. Make sense? This is the charge within a capacitor in terms of the volt and in terms of its capacitance. And also, if you remember from chapter one, that we said that the current, it is the time derivative of the charge over time. It is the time rate of a change of the charge over time. So it should be dq by dt. By if you differentiate dq, which it should be cv, so this is gonna give us the derivative of c times v over dt. So this should give us the derivative of two functions, C and V. So we'd have two possibilities here. Either C is time constant or it is time variable. In case that C is constant, we can move this C outside the derivative as we did here. So we're gonna end up with C equal the time derivative of V with respect to the time, and this is what we're gonna use or assume through this class. So all the time we're gonna consider that C the capacitance of the capacitor, it is constant, it does not depend on the time. But now we can make advanced capacitors that you would have the capacitance of the capacitor itself do depend on the time. So we're gonna end up with two terms, not just one term. But here we're just gonna consider through this course, we're gonna consider the case that the capacitance is constant. So the relation, this gives the relation of the, uh, the current to the volt. Like the current, it is all the time equal constant times the time derivative of the volt with respect to the time. Make sense? If if this is the, the relation of the, if this is the current in terms of the volt, how much is the volt in terms of the current? It should be the integration. If you did integration to this term and integration to this term, this dv by dt bec becomes v, which is the volt. And this one is the integration. So the volt in terms of the current, it should be the integration of the current. So the volt 
it should be the integration of the current and we're gonna divide by one over C. So generally, starting from here, Q equals C times V. This is the charge of the capacitor. C, this is the capacitance of the capacitor. V, this is the volt over the capacitance, the capacitor. And so the volt, it should be Q over C equals one over C. And if you remember from chapter one, we said that the Q, it should be the integration of the current with respect to the time, and there should be plus Q zero over C. Let us assume that Q of T zero over C equals V zero. Because Q over C, according to this equation, Q over C it should give us volt, right? So Q over Z C, at time zero, this let us assume that this term is V zero. So we're gonna end up with this expression for the volt in terms of the of the current. This works like a battery. It means typically the capacitor like a battery that takes energy that it required to be charged, like the battery of your cell phone. We charging your cell phone, then you're gonna use this charge for the mobile application and the last of activities that you are using the cell phone for. So it is typically the same. We are charging, we are giving, we are giving volts. So we have to send a current of electrons over a period of time to be charged depending on the capacitance of the capacitor and in case that it already have some initial voltage. This is like initially charge of the your cell phone battery. So this is the V0, which is the volt, initial volt at time equals zero, at T equals zero. Make sense? So as you can see, there are two expressions here that we are, this is the relation of the current in terms of the voltage, and this is the voltage in terms of the current. This equation, if you try to compare this one to Ohm's law, Ohm's law stated that the volt equals the current times R, the resistance. So this relation, as we mentioned, would have a proportional relation between the volt and the current. This is for the resistor. This is another controller that gives the relation of the volt as the integration of the current. Make sense? So this is for, um, yes, this is for this part. There is an important notice here, down here, this one. For example, how about if we do have, this V is constant. Do you remember the DC voltage? What does, it, what does it mean, DC voltage? It means that we do have direct voltage, right? DC voltage, it means that the voltage of the battery or the source, it is constant over time. It is not varying over time. So in case that we do have V is constant, so it has no time derivative, so we're gonna end up that the current over the capacitor will be zero. What does it mean the current over the capacitor equals zero? It means that the capacitor is gonna work like open circuit. Or the capacitor is gonna work like an open switch of the electrical circuit. Make sense? So in case the capacitor appears or works like an open circuit for a steady state DC voltage, steady state DC voltage, the word steady state is gonna be clear as when we discuss chapter four. But for now, steady state, DC voltage, this indicates that the voltage it is constant. It means that the time derivative of the volt with respect to the time equals zero. For this case, we're gonna say that the capacitor, it works like open circuit, like open switch, okay? So this is the volt in terms of the current and the current in terms of the volt. How about the power? The power, the electric power, as we define chapter one, it should be the volt times the current, generally. For any electrical element, whatever it is, as we discussed many times before, the power it should be the volt times the current through the same electrical element. So if you do have a capacitor, like this one with capacitance C, and there is a current flowing over through this capacitor, and there is a voltage over this capacitor as VT. If you multiply these two terms together, this is gonna give us the electric, electric power over this capacitor. How about the energy? As we define the energy in chapter one, it should be the integration of the power over time from T zero to T. So if we removed, if we replace the power as VI, VI, DT, and did the integration, this should give us the energy. Make sense? 
Can we combine, can we re represent this energy in terms of the capacitance C? Yes. The energy is the integration from T0 to T, V times DT. And we knew that I of T, which is the current in terms of the voltage, equal the capacitance times the derivative of the fault with respect to the time. So substitute with this term here. It's going to be in this way. So as you can see, we do have C times V, which is the volt. C times V times DV by DT times DT. You're going to see that this DT will be canceled with this one. So we're going to end up with C, V, DV. So now we have to switch the limits of the integration from time to volt since the derivative became DV. Make sense? So this is going to give us the integration from zero or general to be much more general. It should be from V0 to V, for example. Or from zero to V, it's up to you. This is going to give us C times V dV. If we did the integration, C is constant. It can be removed outside the integration. What is the integration of V? Gives V square over two. So that's why we end up with one over two C V square. This is the energy stored inside the capacitor in terms of its capacitance and in terms of the volt. How about if we decided to write this volt in terms of the charge, we're gonna end up with this relation, like the energy it is Q squared over 2C according to the fact that Q equals C times V. So V squared, V squared will be Q squared over, uh, over C, right? Yes, V square, V from this one is going to be C square. If you substitute Q square over C square, if you substitute it here, you're going to see one that this C will be cancelled with the square. So you're going to end up with Q square over 2C. Make sense? Like again, the charge over the capacitor, it should be equal to the C, which is the capacitor of the capacitor times the volt. The current, it should be C times the derivative of the volt. The volt, it should be the 1 over C integration of the current dV plus V0, which is the initial voltage stored. This is like initial stored energy inside the capacitor. And in many cases, it, 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 it's, we're going to assume that this term is 0. B, P, P of T, this stands for the power. This is the electrical power that it should be V of T, I of T. Uh, the volt on the current, and this is the energy, which it should be the integration of the power, and the power is already V times I, and we can represent the power with different forms using the either the C times V square or V times Q or Q square over 2C. Make sense? So we're going to consider some examples here on how we can switch, for example, how part of the current is given, how we can drive the charge, the volt, the power, and the energy. How about if the voltage, the one that is was given, how we can drive the current and the other quantities for the capacitor? This is what we're going to practice through this example. Make sense? So the, in this example, we already given this electrical circuit. This electrical circuit is very simple. Include two main elements. The volt, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, voltage source. This is the battery that is already connected to the capacitor. So... This battery, this is very similar to the thing that you watch in the video, that we're already connecting the capacitor just to the battery, so the battery is going to be used in charging the capacitor itself, and that's it. Make sense? So there is a current I of T that is flowing through the electrical circuit. This is the current of the electrons to be used for charging the capacitor. So suppose that the voltage, V of T, shown in the figure B, this is the volt that the battery is going to give over time. So again, V of T, this is the volt as a function of time that the battery is going to give to the capacitor over time. So the capacitor is going to make use of this volt to store energy. So it's applied to one microfarad capacitance. So the capacitance of the capacitor it is one micro. And if you remember that the one micro equals 10 negative 6. So when we said that one micro farad, it means that this is 10 negative 6 farad. Make sense? Because we have to get rid of the micro. So it means that it, the capacitor is already one micro farad. And usually this is a conventional value for the capacitor for any capacitor. 
that it is it, it, basically it comes in the micro scale, like in micro values, like one micro, ten micro, one hundred micro farad, and so on. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. It should be released to some other electrical element that is not shown here, and we are not interested with this thing for now, for this example. So, in this simple example, this is like the half of the electrical circuit that you, you, you saw in the video, right? Like, we have a battery that is directly connected to the capacitor, and this battery will charge the capacitor, and that's it. So, it is required to plot how much of a charge that will be stored inside the capacitor. The stored the charge, how much it is. Draw how this charge is going to change over time. How about the current, I of T, how it's going to change over time? We need to draw, to blot. This is a drawing for the volt over time. We need another graph, another blot of the current and the charge over time, how they are changing. Over time, this, through the capacitance versus time. This is what's required for this problem. Make sense? So, to solve this one, you have to figure out the relation between the current and the volt of the battery and the capacitance. The current, bet the relation between these three parameters, right? So, if we decided to apply Kirchhoff voltage law to this loop, what will be Kirchhoff voltage law to this loop? How about this volt? It should be negative V. Why? Why it should be negative? Because it is input source, right? Plus the volt over the capacitor equals zero. This capacitor will have a volt. There should be a volt over the capacitor. How much it is? We have no clue for now. But according to Ohm's law, according to Ohm's law, the volt over the capacitor, it should be equal to V of T, right? It should be equal to the source, to, to, to the battery volt. So from this equation, we're going to conclude that VC of T which is the volt over the capacitor, it should equal to the battery volt. Make sense? But for example, if you're already given the same problem and for some reason there is a resistance here, this resistance will take some of the volt of the battery. It means that the volt over the capacitor will not be equal to VT. Make sense? But since here we don't have nothing except the capacitor that is already connected in series with the voltage, so according to Kirchhoff voltage law, we're going to end up that the volt over the capacitor is typically the same volt over the battery. It means that the capacitor is going to take all the voltage of the battery to store energy. Make sense? This is the, this is just the first thing, just apply Kirchhoff voltage law to come up with the VC, how much it is. And V of T is already given here. It, is, it means that VC already have a value for VC, which is the voltage over the capacitor. Okay? So, according to this relation, what should be the volt over the capacitor in terms of the current? This is the relation. Or, how much is the current in terms of the volt? This is the relation. How much is the charge in terms of the volt? This is the relation. So, we are going to use these relations to come up with Q and I. Here it is required two things. It is required to find the stored charge. It means that we, we require, we have to find Q, so we have to use this expression, and the current. So these are the two equations that we're going to use. So the charge, it should be the charge Q of T. It should be the capacitance times the volt over the capacitor. How much of the volt over the capacitor? It is already VT, V of T. So it's going to be C times V of T. This is the first equation. Then, in the meanwhile, we have the I of T, it should be, according to this previous equation, the I of T should be C times the time derivative of the volt over the capacitor by dt. How much is the volt over the capacitor? We got it according to Kirchhoff voltage law by V of T, so it's going to be C times T, D, V of T by dt. And this is going to give us the second equation. So, to find Q, and I, and these are the two main requirements. To find Q and I, we have to come up with a value for V of T first, according to this graph. So your objective is just to convert this graph into some equations, because we need this equation to do derivative and substitute to come up with Q and I. And this is what we're going to do. As you're going to look to this shape, this shape is set of lines. 
it means that within this period of time, from zero to two microseconds, the unit here is microseconds. So within zero to two microseconds, the volt, it is a linear function. It is a straight line. But within two to four, it is constant function. Between four and five, it is decreasing line, linear function. So we have to come up or convert this graph into equations. So basically, as you can see, this is like a discrete function because it is discretized over three periods of time. So even from the mathematics, or even you had an experience with this thing in the dynamic class before, if you had a dynamic class, even from physics, you should understand how you can decompose this one or discretize this shape into some equation, this graph. But let me refresh your mind with the mind with the equation of the line. In case generally, let us assume that you do have this is y axis and this is x axis. And we do have a line as, go, as given here. So this line, it will have a slope with an angle theta. So the equation of this line, as you remember, it should be y equals a times x plus b, where a, it should be the slope of the line, and this is slope of the line should be the tangent of the angle theta, and the tangent to find the tangent of the angle theta, it should be, you just gonna pick any two points and measure the vertical height as delta y and the horizontal distance as delta x, and the tangent of theta definitely is gonna be delta y over delta x. This is simply how we can define the slope of a line. And you should remember that this slope, it should be either positive or negative. A positive slope, it means that the direction of the line, if this is y and this is x, and here we have y and x. So for example, this one is a positive slope. The slope here is positive. But if the line goes in this direction, so it, it means that we have a negative slope. So the slope, simply to calculate the slope, it should be delta y over delta x. Just pick any two points in the vertical axis, any two points over the horizontal axis, and calculate delta y over d, delta x. This is going to give us the slope. But this slope would be positive or negative. When I should add a positive sign, we consider this is so positive in case that the line moves from the first quadrant to the third quadrant or the third to the first. It means that this is the inclination of the line. But if the line is already in the opposite direction between the second and the fourth quadrant, so again, so the slope, it would be positive or negative depending on the direction of the line. If the line is going from the first to the third or the third to the first quadrants, so it means it should be positive slope. So your objective is just to calculate delta y, delta x, divide both them together. This is going to give us a, which is the slope. But your objective is just to add negative or positive. Depending on what? Depending on the orientation of the line. If the line is oriented between first and third quadrant, the slope is positive. But if it is between the third and the fourth, the second and the fourth quadrant, it should be negative. Make sense? This is for the slope. B, it, it is known as the y-intercept, which is the intersection point of the, uh, of the line to the y-axis. Yeah, B, it should be the y-intercept. How we can find this y-intercept? Simply, you can draw or calculate using any point over the line you can find this y-intercept as I'm going to show you how we can use these equations or this relation of the line for to come up with a relation for the V of T, the volt, as a function of time. Make sense? So this is the graph that we have here. Let us work over the first period, which is from 0 to 2. So it's basically the volt, V of T, V of T, it should be broken into three periods, right? One period, which it should be from t between 0 to 2 microseconds. The second period, it should be that between 2 and 4 and 4 and 5. So we're going to have here the time. It is between 
2 microseconds to 4 microseconds. And the fourth one between 4 microseconds to T, 5 microseconds. Make sense? So how about the first equation? There is a linear relation. What, it, what should be the slope of this line? Is it, is it positive or negative? Let's speak. Should be positive, right? Why? Because it moves between first quadrant and, and the third quadrant, right? So for this line, it means that the slope, it should be something here, and it should be positive, times t plus b, right? Make sense? What should be the slope? The slope, if I ask you to draw a rectangular shape, I can simply define rectangular shape between this point and this point. So it's going to be this rectangular shape, right? What? This is like delta y and this is delta x. If you divide delta y over delta x, simply you're going to end up with the slope. What should be this height? Just speak. 10. This is 10. Okay? Right, so it is 10, and this horizontal distance, delta x, it should be 2. But 2 what? 2 microseconds. We need it in seconds. So what does it mean? It means that the slope here will be delta y, which is 10, over delta x, which is 2 times 10, negative 6. Why I'm multiplying 10, negative 6? Because it is given in microseconds. Make sense? Plus... B, what should be B? This is the intersection point of the line to the y-axis, to the v-axis. What is the intersection of this line to the v-axis? It will intersect at zero. So what does it mean? It means this means that B equals zero. So this is going to be the first equation for the first line. Make sense? How about the second equation? This horizontal line, this is a constant function. A constant function within the period between 2 and 4. So what does it mean? The line equation would be just 10. Like the volt here would be equal all the time 10. And that's it for this second period. There is a constant function. How about the third period? The slope of this line, it should be negative. Why? It decreases in this way or it moves from the second quadrant to the third quadrant. So it should be negative. So the slope, initially, it should be negative something times t plus b. Make sense? So how much is this slope, your objective again, just big two points. Let us have the start point and the end point and set up a triangular shape with a 90 degree. So this vertical height, it should be delta y. This horizontal distance, it should be delta x. How much is delta y? It is 10 volt again. Delta X, it should be 1, because the difference between 4 and 5 is just 1 microsecond, so it should be 1 times 10 negative 6 in the denominator. So if you divide delta Y over delta X, this should give us here. This should give us 10, but over 10 negative 6, which is 1 times 10 negative 6, which is the delta X. Plus B, how much is B? B, it should be the intersection of this line to the Y axis. How we can find this one, uh, this, this intercept? This line, for example, if you extend it, is going to intersect with the y-axis at a point very way above, right? And one of the things that you can do, use the symmetry of the triangular shapes to come up with this point, or you can simply, which is a very simple, simple method, this line, if you plug, for example, at t equals 5, how much is the volt? At t equal 5, how much of the volt? It should be 0. So what does it mean if you just substitute, plug into this equation here? I'm going to plug into this equation that V equals 0 when T equals 5. So this is going to give us negative 10 over 10 negative 6 times 5 micro. So it should be 10 negative 6. Make sense? Because it is microseconds plus B. So this 10 negative 6 will be cancelled with this one. This is going to give us B equals positive 50, right? Make sense? So again, I need, I got the slope, but how about B? B, it should be the Y intercept or the intersection point 
of this line to the y-axis, which is v-axis. And instead of doing the trigonometry and finding the intersection up there, we can do simple calculation to come up with this b-value. How we can do it simply? Your objective, just substitute with any point, because for example, يعني انت ممكن تيجي تعمل ايه؟ الخط ده انا عارف على نقطتين اللي هي النقطة دي والنقطة دي. خد النقطة دي او النقطة دي، اسهلهم اللي هي النقطة اللي هنا. لما التي تساوي خمسة المفترض الفولت ايكوال كام؟ زيرو. صح؟ فانا هاخد المعلومة دي اعوض بقى في المعادلة اللي انا بدور عليها هنا، انا بدور المعادلة دي لازم تحقق الخط كله. فانا هاخد نقطة واحدة على الخط اللي هي اسهل نقطة فيهم. والمفترض لما التي هنا تساوي خمسة الفولت ده يساوي كام زيرو للمعادلة دي فانا هعمل ايه انا هحط هنا ال V بيساوي زيرو نجرف 10 over 10 نجرف 6 times T T بكام بخمسة مايكرو سكند so it will be 5 times micro which is 10 نجرف 6 10 نجرف 6 هتروح مع 10 نجرف دي 50 تعدى الناحية التانية نجرف 50 تعدى الناحية التانية تبقى بوزيتيف 50 this gives B automatically بدل ما تروح تعمل تشابه مثلثات وتضيع في الوقت اوتوماتيكلي وي كان فايند ذس بي ميك سنس سو ذس مين ذات بي هير ات از ايكوال تو 50 اوكي سو وي جوت ذا فولت ايكويشن اوفر ذا 3 بيريودز ناو وي جونا بلاج ان تو ايكويشن 1 ايكويشن 2 تو كم اب وذ ذا كيو اند ذا كارنت ميك سنس سو فور اكزامبل فور ذا كيو كيو ات مين ذات وي ار جوينج تو مالتيبلاي ذا فولت Times C. How much is C? C is given by one microfarad, which it should be one times ten negative six farad. So you, it means that I'm going to multiply all of these equations times C, which is ten negative six. So if we did so, we're gonna end up with another equation for the charge. The charge will be three other equations. The first equation we were gonna multiply times ten negative six. So it will be times. Or V, it should be 10 negative 6 times V of T, right? So the first equation, if you multiply 10 negative 6, this gives us 5T. That's it. Because 10 negative 6 will be cancelled. This is going to give us 5T plus 0. This is when the current, uh, the time within the range between 0 to 2 microseconds. How about the 10? Multiply 10 negative 6. This is going to give us 10 negative 5. This is when the, current, the, the time within the range between 2 up to 4 microseconds. For this one, if you multiply 10 negative 6, this is going to give us negative 10 T plus 50 times is going to give us 5 10 times 10 negative 5. This is when the time within the range between 4 and 5 and 5 micro, microseconds. Make sense? So this is the charge equation. We are going to draw this one, but later. Now let us find the time, the current equation. The current, it should be C times the derivative of the volt. So we have to differentiate this one first. So it's gonna be C, which is 10 negative six, times the derivative of these functions. What is the derivative of this function? It's gonna give us five times 10 power five, or power six. So it's gonna give us five times 10 power six. Make sense? The derivative of this term will be zero. The derivative of this term will be this, this second one will be zero. This one will be negative 10 power five. It's gonna give us, make sense? This is for these three periods, when the t is between zero and two microseconds, remember in whole is a microsecond, here when t is between zero, uh, two and four microseconds, and in this case when the time t is between uh, four and five microseconds. Make sense? Then you're gonna multiply it times 10 negative six. Let me talk 10 negative six. If you multiply thing in negative six times the three numbers, this is gonna give us how much? Equals, the first term will be just five, the second term will be still zero, you multiply times zero, the third term will be 10 over the three periods. 
Make sense? So we got an equation for the charge. This is the equation of the charge. And this is the equation of the current. Your objective is just to draw these two equations and that is going to be it for this problem. How we can draw these three equations? This is a charge equation, it is a linear function here. It is this, this is the equation of a line with zero intercept B here equals zero, right? And this five, it should be the slope. And I'm gonna let you know how we can draw this one very simple. The same thing, this is a linear function, but this is a constant function. Here, all of these are constants. It means that the current over the time period should be constants in general. So how we can draw this one, how we can draw these equations. The first term, your objective is just to plug data values for the time. In, in, in the graph that is given up there, we do have three time periods. We do have zero, two, four, and five. So we're gonna substitute with the same values here. So for example, for the Q, this is the graph for the Q. This is the time in microseconds, and this is the Q of T. And this is gonna be the graph for the current, where this is the time in microseconds, and this is the current I of T in terms of ampere. And this should be columns, right? So we don't have, we're gonna break down this time period into four periods, two and four and five, as already given in the volt graph. We have zero, two, four, and five. Make sense? So your objective is just to plug with these values. Substitute once t equals zero, t equals two t equals four, t equals five into this data. For Q, when t equals zero, which equation, I do have three equations, which one that I sh should substitute in for t equals zero? The first one, why? Because this is within the period. t should be between zero up to two, right? So if you substitute for t equals zero here, Q definitely will be zero. And this is gonna give us the first point. So we're gonna get Q equals zero. How about when t equals two? t equals two, you can substitute into this equation or this equation. If you substitute for t equals two here, so it will be two times 10 negative six. Remember that the two, it is two microseconds. So two microseconds, it should be two times 10 negative six. Substitute this is gonna give us 10 times 10 negative six, which is gonna give us 10 negative five. Make sense? So according to the first period, according to the first period, when T equals two microseconds, we're gonna have the charge Q will be 10 negative five. And this is gonna give us the second point, and then we can connect these two points with a straight line. Why we are connecting with a straight line? Because it is a linear function here. Make sense? How about this second period? The second period is 10 negative five. It is a constant period between two and four. It means that we do have a constant period of 10 negative five, the same value between two and four as given here. Between five and four, between five and four, the, for example, if the time equals four, substitute for the time equal four times 10 negative six, this is gonna give us 10 negative five. Go ahead. Because it is a constant function. It is a constant function. But for the third period, it is a linear function. There is a straight line. So if you substitute for the time equal four into this equation, you're gonna end up that the you're gonna end up with 10 negative five. So still we have still the same point. When you substitute for T equals five here, so it's gonna be a negative five times 10 negative six. The other option we're gonna substitute for, 10, for T equals five times 10 negative six. This is gonna give us negative five times 10 negative five plus five times 10 negative five will be zero. Yeah, this value will be zero. When we substitute for T equals Five. So this is gonna give us zero here. Then your objective is just to connect these two points together. 
So this is gonna give us the graph, but for the charge. How about the current? The current is the, th the same. We have three functions here. The f all of these three functions are constant functions. We're unlucky. So it's gonna be just five, zero, and 10. Within the period between zero and two, two and four, and four and five. It means that if I decided to draw this one between zero and two, it should be five, constant function. Between two and four, it should be zero. Between four and five, it should be negative 10. It should be negative next to the negative 10. Then your objective is just to close the shape, just connect them, all of them together in this way. So the graph, it will be this graph. This is the graph. It is negative 10 within this period, positive 5 within this period, and 0 within this period in the middle. Make sense? And that's it. So these are the requirements. It was required this to draw this curve and to draw this curve for the current at the charge for the given voltage over this capacitor. Make sense? As you can see here, the in the given voltage equation, in the given voltage equation, the volt within this period was zero, was constant. The volt over this period was constant. So what does it mean? The current over the capacitor within this period it should be zero, according to the node. I mentioned that in, that the capacitor is gonna work like open current circuit, open circuit, in case that the volt is constant. And this is what we got. The volt within the period two to four it is constant. So that's why we got the current within this period is zero. And this makes sense. Also, as you can see, in the beginning here, there was no charge. There is V zero is zero at, at T equals zero. V zero is zero. Then we are increasing, we are delivering, we are sending volts. So there is an increase. This is increasing rate of the volt. The volt here increases, builds up. So we're already charging the capacitor. So that's why within this period, you're going to find that the charge is increasing as well. The charge is increasing and the current is positive. It means that we're already charging. But in the other period here, in the other period, the volt is decreasing. So what does it mean? It means that it is, looks like we're already using or decharging the capacitor. Okay? So that's why the charge was decreasing within the third period, and that's why the current was negative. Make sense? So it means that the graph are consistent with the given voltage up there for this capacitor. All right?